Grace family all over the world, both here in Grand Rapids as well as those of you who support us from various places. Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing at Grace for the Nations Church. In the way of your finances and in the way of your giving and your seed sowing, I just want you to know that you're sowing into good ground and that this is a trustworthy place for you to continue to plant seeds of promise and hope. At Grace, it's our mission, of course, to reach the diverse people of the world by teaching biblical principles and life application of scripture. We've spent some time doing that and having taught and now adapting some kingdom culture codes, one of them in particular is charity. I would like to implore you to be charitable in your giving and to think about the fact that um, the pandemic has caused the church worldwide to suffer some loss. There have been people who were here who are no longer here, and I mean alive at this time, but then there are also people trying to negotiate whether they want to believe in God or believe in the kingdom principles that we hold so dear. So I wanna encourage you to keep giving, keep sowing. If you haven't had a chance to place a seed um, specific to advancing the kingdom of God here at Grace for the Nations Church, you can follow the instructions on the screen and, and do so. Sow a seed in good ground and know that there is going to be a bountiful harvest in your life. Thank you for giving to Grace for the Nations Church. So Lexi, I got a question for you. Yeah, what's up? How long, how long have you been here at Grace? About six years. Six years? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's about 2016? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay, all right, so I got here in 2017. And the reason why I, I bring that up is because um, Pastor and Lady Eva Lachey has been here at Grace for 20 years, but they've been serving in ministry for 35. And so this year on September 11th, we want to honor um, our leaders um, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan um, with the ministry gala, the 2035 ministry gala. Once again, recognizing our pastors, our leaders. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's amazing. Two decades total. And then 35 years of ministry, we cannot wait to just love on our pastors and recognize them for the amazing sacrifice and work that they've been doing um, for the kingdom of God. So if you want more information, please stay tuned. Oh, hi. Do you need a quiet space to work and get things done? Or you would like to switch up your work from home routine? Then the growth workspace is for you. Stay tuned for more details. Hello, Grace. On July 17th, we will be here at the campus of Grace for the Nation's Church for our outdoor worship experience. It's going to be one of three that will be happening throughout the summer. So make sure that you bring a friend and that you tell that friend to bring another friend. And all you guys come here at 3 p.m. Again, 3 p.m. for the worship experience. We'll see you soon.
bless you. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're holy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're awesome. So faithful, faithful, so faithful, 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 Lord. Yeah. So you're faithful, so faithful, you're faithful, so faithful, 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 Lord. Yeah. Can you help me say? serve a God who was faithful. He's always there. He's always there. Yeah, yeah. So you're faithful. So faithful. You're faithful. So faithful. Faithful, faithful Lord. Yeah. Can you help me say faithful? So faithful. So faithful. So faithful. So faithful. Faithful, faithful Lord. You're mighty in battle, mighty in battle, yeah. Mighty, so mighty, you're mighty, so mighty, 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 Lord. Yeah. Can you help me say mighty, mighty, so mighty, so mighty, so mighty, so mighty. jump into the word of the Lord. I want to pray and we're going to continue in our discussion about kingdom. Something that the Lord has laid upon my heart that's a little bit different than the uh, series that we've previously done with the kingdom culture codes or even just restoring 
um, the kingdom in general is the authority of the kingdom. I see through the spiritual eyes of leadership that we've lost a great deal of respect for the church. We've lost a great deal of respect for the body of Christ, the gifts, the talents, the things that God has charged us with. And our religion has become really the opiate of the people. And we are longing and desiring to do the same things that we've done before or to try to recapture the things that we've seen to work in the past. I, I strongly believe that we've come to a place in time where we are to be innovative and we are to be um, what we would call in real time because the Lord is dealing with us regarding the kingdom. I shared a conviction that I had about the Lord speaking to me in saying that we have spent a whole lot of time trying to restore the church, when in actuality, he's assigned us to restore the kingdom. I think about the scripture in Matthew, the 16th chapter, where Jesus tells Peter that his name is Peter, and upon this rock, he will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it's not our assignment, it's not our duty or responsibility to build the church, it's our responsibility to build the kingdom. Jesus' instructions to the believer was to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to establish the kingdom on earth. Let's pray over this word. <clears throat> Father, we thank you and we give you praise for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to share the word. We thank you for our understanding and revelation on kingdom things. We thank you because as we teach, we're advancing, we're expanding, and we're building upon the principles of the kingdom of God. Your word declares that the kingdom is at hand and we're to prepare the people of God for the King of Kings. So, Lord, I pray this word would minister to somebody today and that somehow it will, trinity, it will penetrate the hearts of your people in your son's name. Amen. Let's go to Romans 13. <clears throat> Romans the 13th chapter, verse number one. It gives us some instructions, but it is talking about submission to the governing authorities that exist. But these governing authorities are earthly authorities. And first, I want to kind of establish what it means to operate under the submission of kingdom authority. I know we, we've done teaching for years and years on spiritual authority, but who's teaching us about the kingdom and the kingdom authority that's resident on the inside of us and that we're also subject to through the various authorities that are placed in the earth? So really, kingdom authority is to recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ or the deity and sovereignty of God and his delegated authorities to those who are believers. First, of course, with his only begotten son, having the dominion over all the earth, everything living and everything dead. Jesus is the ultimate authority. But we being the ambassadors of the kingdom and being representatives of the kingdom have often been, I guess, guilty of misrepresenting the authority that's on the inside of us. I think about how marriage is an authoritative uh, covenant. I think about how child rearing or child birth is an authoritative covenant. I think about how when we enter into contractual agreements, whether they be in business or even signing a lease or a mortgage or a covenant of oath of any sort, is really a spiritual authoritative agreement. And what I think has happened, and this is just strongly in, in, in my spirit, that we haven't seen the miracles, we have not seen the power, we've not seen the manifestation of God's glory in the earth over sickness, death, destruction, disease, because we're not operating within the authority that we've been given or the kingdom authority that should be established here on earth has been in some way compromised. It's been compromised. And generation after generation and after generation, we've come in under the guise or the misconception that we're operating in authority. We were told that we can bind the devil, we can loose angels, we were told that we can command heaven and that we can make declarations. But, but who's teaching us how to, to yield to the authorities of God in order to operate in the authority that God has given us? I think about the fact that marriage is the example that I gave a little bit earlier. Being a covenantal agreement or being an authoritative covenant, it, it's one of the most powerful covenants on the earth because it's the very first covenant that God established with humanity. When he gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to become one, the scripture declares in Genesis that for this cause, a man leaves his father and his mother is joined into his wife and the two becomes one flesh. And then he talked about them having dominion or authority over the earth in their oneness. And I think we miss it because of the romanticism of marriage or the sensuality associated with marriage and consummation and children and those things. And we may overlook or we may fail to consider the fact that God established this covenantal agreement to establish his authority in the earth 
in an exponential fashion. We find later the scriptures admonishes that one of us can chase a thousand, but two of us can put 10,000 of the enemy to flight. We also find that if any two or more of you touch and agree upon anything concerning the will of God, it will be done of God. And so when we look at restoring the kingdom, we must look at restoring kingdom authority. And in order to restore kingdom authority, we have to yield to authority in order to operate in authority. We must yield to authority to operate in authority. So let's take a look at some scripture. I want to go to Romans, the 13th chapter, and starting at the first verse of, 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 this, of this chapter, we have some instruction as it relates to submission to authority. And there's some revelation in this. Often it's been mistaught. I may be guilty of having mistaught it myself. But we talk about submission, and we use it oftentimes as a rebuke to get people to understand how if you just go along with the law of the land, everything will be fine. And that's not true. We know that there are countless, countless numbers of people who've abided by the law of the land, and they found themselves being victim to the authorities of which they submitted themselves to or even tried to resist some type of harm and were killed. I'm being diplomatic about it, but we know that the authorities that we know in the earth are not always authorities of righteousness. We know that the authorities that we've seen in the earth are not always operating in the best interest of all people. We know that the authorities in the earth have been infiltrated by the enemy in the kingdom of darkness, of which Satan has the power as the prince of the darkness of this world. He has some authority. So there's the authority of light, and then there's the authority of darkness in the earth that does currently coexist. Now, the Bible tells us that the light of Christ that shines in the heart of men is a light that cannot be comprehended or overthrown by darkness, but there's a battle. There's an authoritative struggle for the kingdom of God to be reestablished, and I want to challenge believers to stop just thinking about the church and the comforts of what we know and start thinking about the kingdom and the authority of the kingdom. Because whether we have a building, whether we gather in, in tents or temples or tabernacles, the authority of the kingdom is resident on the inside of kingdom citizens. The authority of God's kingdom is resident on the inside of His men and women that He's chosen, who's submitted themselves to His authority to operate in authority. And we operate in a couple of different ways. I'm going to get to the scripture in just a moment, but I want to jot some notes or give you at least a couple of things to build off of, that when we operate in kingdom authority, our, our conversation literally reflects the authority that we have. The words that come out of our mouths, the lifestyle that we live, the choices that we make. Now, think for a moment, operating in authority under submission is a choice. So the words that we speak are the chosen tools or instruments that we've selected in order to operate in authority. In talking to one of my grandsons, I'll call his name and, and ask him to come here because he's obviously going in an opposite direction of where it is that I think he should go. And as his authoritative voice or as his authority, I'll call him by name and tell him to come. He, of course, in his youth, his frivolity, in his innocence, as well as his guilt of Adam nature, will want to go in the opposite direction. In fact, I'll, I'll sternly raise my voice and call him by name and say, come to me. He goes in the opposite direction. I'll then further begin to give him a look of intensity, and I'm sure every parent that's watching this right now, or every parent remembers looking at that child saying, you better come here or something's going to happen. Well, this particular child has a sense of humor and that seriousness is, is a joke to him. That seriousness is obviously humorous because he thinks somebody's playing or thinks that it's okay to kind of look cute and go in the opposite direction. The lesson that I gleaned from this experience is that we're often that guilty as innocent children with that devilish mentality that when God calls us to come close to him, we giggle, we laugh, and we disobey. We go knowing that ultimately we're going to still be loved, we're still going to be coddled, we're still going to be changed when we make a mess, and we're still going to be tolerated as dear children. And I keep giving these air quotes because I think the misrepresentation is that we don't have to respond to the authoritative voice of God when in actuality we do. Now, I'm not my grandson's father, I am his father's father. And I'm using it as an illustration because the authority of the father is passed on from generation to generation. I'll say that again real slow. The authority of the father, God the father, is passed on from generation to generation. And so my authoritative voice has been given 
to the individual that is my son, and my son in turn is using his voice of authority to his son, and you kind of get the picture that'll pass on and on. Well, that being the case, God has given authority to those who believe to speak words of power in the earth and to exercise the authority of the kingdom. That's been lost. It's been lost because the church has been degraded by those, in, those inside and outside of the church. It's been lost because the church has been in some way discredited as being the established institution that literally fights hell in the earth. The church has somehow lost the, the power of its intention, the reason why he put it here, and it's become something else. It's become something that is a little less authoritative. And so when we're called by virtue of the church, we laugh, giggle, and go in the opposite direction. Or when we're called or summons to assemble ourselves, we want it in, in, in our timing and under our conditions and what we like. Somebody asked me last week about service going back to what it was or being um, in, in some way familiar with what they were familiar with. I don't want to knock anybody's need or desire. But I do believe that, that God has given us an opportunity here to rethink what we've done that was or was not working. God has given us an opportunity to see that the airwaves are golden opportunities to reach people that will never get up off their couch out of their bed and come to a church building. It's also given us the opportunity to perfect and hone in on our messages that they are a lot less entertainment and a whole lot more educational or spiritually challenging or instructional that we would hear His voice and harden out our hearts. You see, if we continue to replicate the nostalgic feelings that we get when we come together, then we'll be somehow, through a placebo effect, given a false sense of healing or a false sense of cure or a false sense of wholeness when those things disband or we're somehow rejected from the assembly again, we'll be at a loss. And we'll find ourselves cowering in fear because we don't have a respect or honor for the spiritual authority that is resident, not just in the church, but in the people of God. Statistics tell us that a third of the people who attended church prior to the pandemics are no longer going to church and they no longer desire to go to church. Now, that doesn't mean that those people don't believe in God. They just don't believe in church. I'll let that settle in. It doesn't mean that they don't believe in God, but I question their ability to have a very wholesome full relationship and experience with God if they're not convening in some way with God's people. Well, there are alternatives. There are people who gather in small groups. There are people who take the church to the beach, the streets, the park, or whatever. And I, and I, I think those are great ideas and awesome opportunities because the early church that we find in the book of Acts wasn't established in a building. In fact, as soon as they were birthed through the, the, the outpouring, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, they were dispersed out into the streets. And then they were dispersed into every region of the world by which now we have access to what the church is supposed to be. Where we got caught was putting it in one spot, putting it under one roof, thinking that one person had all the authority, not recognizing the influence of those people who are influencers, being powerful and instrumental tools in helping to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Instead, we became comfortable and relied on the nostalgia and the feeling of of what we get when we come together, whether it's food or fellowship or fun. I believe that this scripture helps us to understand that. Let's take a look. In the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, and this is the New International Version. I think it helps to clarify um, the illustrated point that I'm trying to bring. It says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers hold not terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They're God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. I got to pause there because this scripture is probably one of the most widely misinterpreted and most widely taught incorrect scriptures, taught incorrectly, 
<coughs> excuse me, of all scriptures. I find that this scripture has been used dating back to pre-emancipation to subject people in some kind of way to authorities that were not godly authorities or to some ritual of life that was not a part of God's original plan, whether it be chattel slavery or just the improprieties of subjecting people to being less than someone else. It is not intended to be used as a sword to beat people down or to keep someone lower than someone else. As Paul is writing or as the scripture is being conveyed in its original intent, it was to create some order so that the kingdom of God will be able to be established in these early stages here in the earth. It was being written to a group of people who did not understand why authorities in the earth had some ranking in the big picture of things since we've now been converted and conformed to Jesus as opposed to um, being conformed to the world and the things that are in the world. It's almost contradictory that the scripture that Paul says in another verse says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here it says, submit yourselves to the authority that exists here in the world. Now, it's not a contradiction because God's word does not contradict itself. But what's contradictory is us not being able to comprehend or understand both the natural and the spiritual implications of the word. The natural implications and the spiritual implications is that we are in this world, but we're not of this world. We're even instructed to make friends with mammon, but the love of mammon, which is money or the world system, is the root of all evil. Now, Jesus doesn't contradict himself, but Jesus says make friends with mammon because money answers all things. But Jesus also says the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's the love of mammon, not the acquaintanceship or the operation of mammon or the systems that's evil. And so the authorities that exist are supposed to be authorities to to execute the will of God and not someone else's will, not someone else's own desires. Where we find ourselves most caught up currently is not being able to even respect the authority of the spiritual leaders that have been established for us. Yeah, because of their humanity. Yeah, because of their, their flawedness. Yeah, because of their lack of integrity. Yeah, because of their humanity. Yeah, because they're humans too, and I'm not justifying anybody's wrong. But I am saying that God never intended for anyone to supersede the spirituality of Jesus Christ, who in the form of human flesh faced every sin, but without sin, became the sacrifice of sin that we might be able to live unto a forgiven and eternal life. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying that the authority that Jesus Christ took when he took death, hell, and the grave, when he made an open show of Satan and the judgment of sin, which was death, when he took all of those things onto himself, and then he breathed onto us salvation, we now operate in the authority that was that was gained or won by Jesus Christ himself. And in operating under the authority of Christ, then we are obedient to the laws of the land, but we're the lawmakers of the land. And that's the part that we don't see in the scripture. The part where our influence is supposed to be the governing voices by which we live in order that the kingdom would be established in the earth. So we shouldn't have to run when we see the police. We should be the police, godly, righteous men and women of God who will exact the authorities that they've been given to keep peace or order, not to kill somebody or to shoot somebody out of their own anger or bigotry or hatred or malice or fear. Fear. When we think about how the authorities of the earth have become so twisted because of their lack of faith in God or their lack of submission to the authority of God, people have thought to themselves to become gods or that they are better than someone, or that they have been appointed by God to subject someone else when that's not the intent. So the scripture tells us to be subject to the authorities of God that are in the earth, but where it's convoluted is we don't know who's representing the kingdom and who's not. So I'm challenging believers to stand up and to rise. I know there's got to be some saved police officers. I know there's got to be some Christian judges. I know that there are some lawyers and public defenders, and I know that there are some hospital administrators and some people who allocate uh, uh, resources and dollars to communities that's born-again believers, blood-washed, Bible-believing, devil-chasing, tongue-talking people of God who are in authority that can help to keep the order that's necessary that we don't hurt ourselves or that we don't consume everything that's in the earth and every natural resource is gone. I believe that there's Christians everywhere on this planet. I believe that if there were people on the moon, there'd be some Christians there. And I believe, I'm talking true Christians, I'm talking kingdom representatives. 
I'm talking about people who are extraterrestrial, meaning that we're here in this world, but we're not of this world. And we know that ultimately there'll be a new heaven, a new earth established, and that the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, is not clothes, is not a physical building, but it's within us. And it's our responsibility to manifest the kingdom of God. I want to close with this verse, and it's very, very compelling. In these verses, we're instructed to yield ourselves. Verse number five of the first, excuse me, of the 13th chapter says this. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. My conscience tells me that I can submit to authorities when I know that the authorities have been influenced by God. But when they haven't been submitted to God and when laws and when ordinances have become acceptable that are in opposition of the law of God, that tells me that we've missed it. I'm not angry at the people who've misinterpreted what it means to be free or what it means to be yourself or to live your truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if my truth is contradictory to the truth of Jesus Christ, and the law of life in Christ that makes me free from the law of sin and death, then I need to check me for conscience sake. I need to check the ordinances of my community. I need to somehow stand up for what is right regardless of what has been written in the laws of the books or the books that are in the natural laws. Spiritual authority is a very important piece. I'm gonna continue to teach on it. I'll teach on it until kingdom authority has been restored. Until we get to the place of I'm in my role in this earth to restore the authority of the kingdom on this planet. And I'm not here just to get a good job, to make good money, and to live a good life. But I am here as a representative. You are here as a representative. We are here as representatives of the kingdom of God established in the earth in order to show forth God's light to a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we give you honor for this word. We thank you for the time that we shared in it. As we continue to teach on restoring kingdom things, give us kingdom understanding. Give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of what it means to restore kingdom authority in the earth through our lifestyle, through our choices, through the manifestation of your word and your wisdom and the power of your